about ladies and welcome to our weekly edition of Torah classes and whether you're logging on to ohelsara.com or Torah anytime or if you're a YouTube subscriber and you're following us uh, on YouTube we thank you so very much and we're so proud of your devotion and dedication to Torah learning to the words of Hashem to the elevation of your spirit and your soul Be'ezrat Hashem, I hope that as a result of your spiritual endeavors, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should bring you to a place of true inner peace and happiness with an elevated ruchaniyut, with an elevated spirituality, so that you can decipher between truth and falsehood, so that you should have bracha and not chaz v'shalom, the opposite, should, should never chaz v'shalom experience any dinim in your life. As a result, of your efforts not just to learn but to to actually activate your learning in your daily life first and foremost I want to dedicate this shiur we said that this entire year other than those who want to sponsor you know a shear for a loved one for Nilui Neshama or for Rufua Shlema or for Zivu Gagun whatever it is we're going to be uh, these next 10 months going to be dedicating our shiurim also to Simantov Moshe HaKohen Ben Tamara, Allah uh, Shalom, who was a very big and hidden tzaddik. HaKadosh uh, Baruch Hu died at a very young age, at the age of 42. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give tremendous nechama to the family. This was a shock to the family. And Bezat Hashem, our shiurim, and uh, like I said, your activation of whatever it is that you're learning from the shiurim should be an aliyat neshama for him, should help elevate his soul mala mala to the highest places in the heavens. And Bezat Hashem, he should be a melitz yosher. He should be an advocate for all of Am Yisrael and anyone who needs beracha v'yeshua refuot v'yeshuot in any aspect of your life. In addition, uh, I just want to quickly uh, clarify something that I said last week because I got an email from a woman living in Lakewood about the comment that I made where I said where that I lived in this God-forsaken place in Lakewood so I just want to clarify that I did not mean all of Lakewood I meant one particular uh, spot um, that still is uh, according to what I hear not exactly the best uh, spiritual spiritually conducive place for uh, Jews to be living in. Uh, and so Baruch Hashem, I spoke with that uh, woman and I explained my view and what I experienced in that particular place and how that place is quite anti-Semitic and uh, the majority of the people living there are Goim, are Gentiles. Uh, it wasn't fun for me to drive to my house and see crosses and statues and lights and Santa Clauses um, you know <laughs> I, I always put it this way I explained to the lady a Jew has to be living in a Machane Kadosh in a place that when he walks out of his house he sees the life and spirit of Judaism coming to life on a on a second to second basis and not that it's sprinkled here and there and maybe not at all not during the day not at night, not on Shabbat, not during Chagim, not that it's uh, insulated and isolated to maybe one particular place, no, but that you see Jewish children running around everywhere, coming home from school, and not the opposite, not that uh, little children are not allowed on premises uh, because Chaz Shalom they shouldn't disturb the neighbors, not that you're not allowed to build a shul there, and even if you do, it shouldn't be something that's a quote-unquote a real congregation, but uh, something that's mistater ma'chorea pargod, and uh, you have to be limited to how many congregants you have there. Not where my sukkah is limited to how big or small it should be, and if I don't remove my sukkah the day after sukkot, I'm then penalized and have to pay. This is this is not the way Jews live. So I explained to this woman. I want to explain something else about what I said. I don't think that today, no matter where you're living, if it's uh, even, I told her, even if it's in the yeshivish part of Lakewood, uh, I don't think that today anybody can say 
that there isn't one place uh, in the United States where the left, and when I say the left, I don't mean the Democrats, I mean the hardcore liberals who are taking over, the ones who met have forsaken God. Uh, have in, uh, we can't say that there's a place in the United States that hasn't yet been infiltrated. Kolel Lakewood, even the, the most religious parts of Lakewood. Uh, sadly, uh, me and this woman both agreed that the whole United States is becoming one big Zdom Vamora, even probably worse than Zdom Vamora. And, and therefore, it doesn't really matter whether it's a God-forsaken place where I lived or a, a, the whole United States that's becoming God-forsaken. It's still the same problem. The problem is that Jews, sadly, have no corner on the, on the, on the chart of the United States, on the map of the United States, where they can uh, freely and, and wholeheartedly practice their religion because they're infiltrating everywhere. It's not for now, that's already a political discussion, but just so you know that there, the government is already trying to infiltrate the yeshivot and it won't be long before, uh, sadly, we're going to see tremendous opposition against Jewish people and their lifestyle as well. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Those who are living in religious areas, in a machane kadosh mamash, I'm very proud of you and that's the way it should be. And if you're, uh, if you're maintaining your kedusha, that's, that's, that's great. But in general, even if you're living in the religious area, it's already coming to your, uh, you know, like a, coming to a theater near you soon. <laughs> that, that's what's happening. So beware of what's happening. Try to make your arrangements to, to leave and to come to Eretz Yisrael as soon as you possibly can. Uh, well, having said that, we have a lot of work to do today, and maybe the shiur will answer uh, this question as well of what should we do? What should we do? This week's parasha is Shlach in Eretz Yisrael, and there's a very mysterious episode that's not easy to comprehend concerning the Meraglim, the 12 spies, the 12 leaders of which one was from each tribe, who were dispatched by Moshe Rabbeinu alav shalom to scout Eretz Yisrael prior to Am Yisrael's entry into the land. Sadly, their scouting mission wasn't successful. 10 out of the 12 spies returned with a negative report concerning the Holy Land. And as a result of that terrible report, the Jewish people believed the uh, Nesi'im, those 10 Nesi'im, those 10 leaders, and they started to cry and complain to Moshe Rabbeinu, what did you do? Why are you bringing us into this terrible land now? Let us go back to Egypt, or we'd rather die in the desert. As a result of this uh, reaction, Am Yisrael suffered for 40 years in the Midbar. That entire generation perished in the desert and was not allowed to enter Eretz Yisrael. Only two of the 12 leaders came back with a positive report. Uh, that was Kalev ben Yefune, alav shalom, and Yehoshua ben Nun, alav shalom. We also know that when Moshe Rabbeinu commissioned the Meraglim, these spies, and appointed them, he approached each of them and assigned them with a particular task. And when he approached his foremost student, Yehoshua ben Nun, he blessed him. Now, Yehoshua's name wasn't always Yehoshua. His birth name was Hoshea. But Moshe Rabbeinu wanted an offer, an additional tefillah and blessing, a bracha, so that he could be saved, Yehoshua, from the ensuing plot of the uh, other ten spies, his colleagues. So it seems that even Moshe Rabbeinu suspected from the very beginning that this mission might fail, that something might go wrong. What did Moshe do? He took the letter Yud and he added it to Hoshea's name. And now instead of Hoshea, he became Yehoshua. What's the significance of that letter? Rashi HaKadosh Alav Shalom explains that Moshe Rabbeinu Davin saying, 
יא יושיעך מעצת מרגלים. God should save you from the plot of the spies. יא is one of Hashem's names spelled יוד ה'. So Moshe Rabbeinu prayed for Yehoshua's safety, asking Hashem to save him from any negative intent or influences that the other leaders uh, might have or anything that they might be plotting. And the question Chachamim have is, is it fair that Yehoshua is the only one who merited to receive a bracha from Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe should want all the leaders, all the spies to succeed. It seems like each leader from every tribe was approached and given a particular job, but then when Moshe Rabbeinu approached Yehoshua, he kind of whispers an added bracha into his ear saying, Ya Yoshiacha me'atzak meraglim. Now the other leaders, they could have complained, they could have said, uh, why didn't we receive a bracha for success? Why should Moshe favor Hoshea and not us? And the explanation is as follows. We all know that each of us possesses a neshama, a God-given soul. According to the Zohar Kadosh, the neshama is called a chelek eloka mima'al. It's a small piece of Hashem above that's within us. We also know that on Shabbat, for example, we're endowed with an additional neshama, which is called the neshama yetera, the extra neshama. That second soul enters our being gradually over the 24-hour period of the Shabbat. Uh, Chachamim tell us that uh, part of the neshama yetera settles itself on Friday night, uh, then it continues to settle in through Shabbat morning and then through the time of Musaf davening during Shacharit. So during the 24 hour period of Shabbat, we receive an additional soul that rests within us throughout the Shabbat. And Chachamim teach us that a person who observes the Shabbat correctly is able to reach very lofty levels of spirituality. Why? Because besides his own neshama, he has that additional neshama that energizes his entire being. It's like having a double engine. So the neshama yatera helps us to reach exalted levels, dafka on the Shabbat, which in itself is one of the holiest days of the week. Uh, there are times in life where a person is involved in a very important task, a very important mission that was assigned to him from Shamaim. Sometimes it's unbeknownst to him, sometimes he doesn't realize it, but there is a specific mission he needs to accomplish. That mission is so critical that Hashem wants the person to succeed and failure is not an option because if the person fails it's going to create an enormous negative consequence for himself and also for Am Yisrael and maybe even the entire world. So in those kinds of situations what does Hashem do? Ladies we're about to go into a very very esoterical part of the Torah so hold on to your seats. The Ariya Kadosh Alav Shalom in his Sefer Shar HaGilgulim explains that a Kadosh Baruch who summons the Neshamot, the souls of great Tzadikim, of very righteous people who have already passed on from this world. He dispatches those holy souls into this world and commands them to enter the bodies of those people on earth who were endowed with a very important task. Just like the Neshama Yatera that we're endowed with on Shabbat gives us that extra spiritual boost, there are times where Hashem will infuse us with the Neshama of a Tzadik or a Tzadikah, could be female also, in order for the unique and holy energies of those righteous individuals to assist us in completing that very important mission. 
So HaKadosh Baruch Hu provides us literally with divine assistance in order for us to be able to be successful in our spiritual endeavor, whatever that endeavor will be. So while that neshama is embedded within us, uh, it could be temporarily, it could be for a long period of time, we suddenly possess capabilities that breed success. Now, that's not something that any person in our generation is capable of doing. So let me just give you that warning in advance. But the tzaddikim of yesteryear, they were able to do something that the Yari calls uh, uh, ibur neshama. Uh, what that means is that, like I said, that there's a neshama of a tzaddik that attaches itself within you in, in order to give you an added dose of spiritual energy. For example, the holy Ben Ishchai Alev Shalom from Baghdad, who was known in the Torah world as a Talmudic genius, he was a Gaon Sheba Geonim, and he was also a Mekubal, he was known as a, a mystic. When the Ben Ishchai came to Eretz Yisrael, he visited the kever, the gravesite of the holy Benayahu Ben Yehoyada Alev Shalom, who was Shlomo HaMelech's uh, army general, Alav Shalom, uh, Shlomo Amelech. But Benayahu himself was a huge Torah scholar. His kever, his gravesite, is located in Tzfat. So the Ben Ishchai went to daven at the kever of this holy man, Benayahu Ben Yehoyada, and he remained there for three full days. He didn't leave that spot. When he finally left, he said that he was suddenly able to reach very high levels of spirituality and deep secrets and revelations of the Torah were unexpectedly revealed to him. The Ben Ishchai said that he has no doubt that the neshama of Benayahu Ben Yehoyada entered his being. In other words, the Ben Ishchai experienced something called Ibur Neshama of who? Of Ben Yahu Ben Yehoyada. And as a result, he said that it kind of catapulted him to new heights of spirituality, which is hard to believe because the Ben Ishchai was already on such a high level, but he says he felt catapulted to new heights. So somehow the Ben Ishchai was a big tzaddik and a big mekubal. He knew what to do and he knew which prayers, which tefillot to recite at the kever of Benayahu Ben Yehoyada in order to receive the Ibur Neshama. So these great tzaddikim of, of yesteryear, they were able to activate an Ibur uh, Neshama through certain incantations, kavanot, uh, tefillot, certain actions that they did. So obviously that's not for us. We don't know how to do it, what to do. But the Ari Kadosh explains that the mission of the spies was very vital for the future of Am Yisrael. Therefore it was important that they not fail. Because if the spies succeeded in their mission according to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's will, if they would have returned with a positive report, the Jewish people, just a few days later, would have entered the land and Moshe Rabbeinu would have been the one to build the holy Bet Migdash, the holy temple. If Moshe Rabbeinu then would have built the Bet Migdash, it would have remained intact forever. It would have never been destroyed because Moshe Rabbeinu's Midah, his spiritual trait, was that of something that's called Netzach. Netzach means eternal. That means that whatever Moshe Rabbeinu is involved in takes on the attribute of Netzach. It remains in existence forever, for all eternity. So if he would have built the Bet HaMikdash, it would have stood for all eternity. Nobody would have ever been able to destroy the Bet HaMikdash. And also the Ari says Mashiach would have revealed himself in that generation and everyone would have lived happily ever after. That's how important the mission of the spies was. If their mission succeeded, the entire world would have reached its ultimate tikkun, the ultimate rectification of the entire world, and we would have lived in a peaceful and utopian state, just like we did back in Gan Eden. 
But there's something else we have to know. In life, whenever you have a great mission or something powerfully positive, spiritually positive, that has to be accomplished, there's always going to be a resistance coming from the sitra acha, coming from the dark side, the other side, which means that important things, important relationships, spiritual endeavors, holy undertakings don't come easy at all. There's always a lot of conflict surrounding that lofty task or relationship, a lot of controversy, intensity, and many stumbling blocks placed by the other side when there's something of great value that must be achieved. Look at it this way. When they want to build a casino in Las Vegas, they miraculously succeed to build it in a span of a year, a year and a half, the Satan does not get in the way of a casino being built because he knows that there's nothing good that's going to come out of its construction. But when we want to build a shul, suddenly things progress at a very slow pace. Why is it, why is it that way? Isn't a shul, isn't a house of study and prayer more important than a casino? Yes, it is. For that reason, the Satan not only allows the casino to be built as quickly as possible, he assists in the construction. He doesn't get in the way. But when we want to construct something that's going to produce spirituality and religion and, and elevation, uh, something that's going to bring us closer to our mission, closer to God, the Satan all of a sudden wakes up and places many stumbling blocks in our path. Suddenly we're faced with so much opposition, so much conflict, so much resistance, so much intensity, so much complication. It becomes such a complex situation. The Satan knows how to make people stall and destroy what he knows is a grand master plan. But Chachamim tell us that dafka, dafka means especially when you see and you feel the great opposition, the enormous conflict and controversy and the difficulty, that's when you know that the Satan is lurking in your midst because he knows that whatever your spiritual endeavor is, it's going to lead to greatness. It's going to lead to some tikkun over here that needs to be wrought, to some positive consequence, and to some spiritualistic future result that needs to be wrought in the world. The stronger and more powerful the spiritual endeavor is, the more opposition you're going to face, and the harder the Satan is going to come after you. So what's the suggestion of the Chachamim? The Chachamim say, you have to fight the Satan at his own game. You have to be just as strong, just as resilient, just as stubborn, and you have to allow that resistance and difficulty and ride the wave through to the other side. Now, that's very, very difficult. Chachamim say that could be very difficult because it could take a few days. That's not a long time, by the way. It could take a few weeks. Chachamim say it could take a few months and even years, depending on the spiritual stature, depending on the spiritual mission and the tikkun. But, once the Sita Akhra realizes that you're not going to give up and that you're moving forward through and to your tikkun, eventually HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells the Sita Akhra, listen, it's very clear that in this case over here, nobody's giving up. They're going to move forward and nothing that you do is going to get in the way of their mission. So you know what, why don't you just close this case and move on to something else. I'm going to give you an example from the Chafetz Chaim Alav Shalom. He asks, why are yeshivot, Jewish institutions of study, in deficit, while the various colleges and universities of the Gentiles, they have great endowments. 
they receive millions of dollars in donations. You know why? The Chafetz Chaim says that it's because many of the teachings in those Gentile institutions, <laughs> they're heretical, those teachings. Their curriculum and syllabus was, was probably drafted by the Satan himself. So the Satan sees to it that such institutions acquire support in order to continue promoting their heretical agenda. But the yeshivot, in contrast to these colleges, they're teaching the truth. They're teaching about God, about His Torah, about spirituality, about connecting to God, about being a spiritual person. So there's great resistance on the part of the Satan. He attempts to make it difficult for us to exist. But the Chafetz Chaim, like the Ariya Kadosh, says, you have to be strong, you have to fight the resistance, and eventually the Satan will move on and away. By the way, that resistance can come in the form of somebody very religious that you trust. You could say, how is it possible that the Satan is em employing this person? That's why he's employing him, because it looks good, sounds good, it seems right, but it's not necessarily right, and we're going to see that as we progress in this Shi'ul. Because in our story over here, Moshe Rabbeinu was very concerned, and rightfully so, that in this expedition, the spies are going to encounter a great resistance from the dark side. The Satan was not going to make it easy for them. He was going to place many challenges and, and obstacles in their way so that they dafka don't succeed. He wanted them to fail. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, as great and as holy as these men are, Although they are the choicest of their tribes, these are Nesi'im, I still need to infuse them with the neshama of a tzaddik. They all require a spiritual upgrade. They need a boost for this particular mission. They need an ibur neshama. So what did Moshe Rabbeinu do? The Ariya Kadosh tells us that he literally brought down from Shamaim the neshamot, the souls of the original 12 tribes. And the pasuk in the parasha hints that to us. Listen to these words. Vayishlach otam Moshe mimidbar paran al pi Hashem. And Moshe sent them out, the spies, from the desert of Paran by the word of God. Kulam anashim. All of them were men of distinction. Rashi b'nei Israel hema. They were the heads of the children of Israel. We know they were the Nesim. They were the heads of the tribes. But the Yariya Kadosh says that the words Rashi b'nei Israel means not only that they were the heads literally of their tribes during that generation, but it means that they were actually the original Shvatim, the original tribes, Rashi b'nei Israel. The, the neshamot of the original tribes in, uh, uh, um, were embedded in their bodies, so they were like the original tribes. So for example, when the Torah states in this parasha, I'm going to read you the words, reuven, when it's telling us who went out in this mission, we're told, reuven, from the tribe of Reuven, the representative of that tribe was Shamua ben Zakur. Very nice. Now, Shamua represented the tribe of Reuven. But the Ari says it's deeper than that. Le Mater Reuven means that Moshe Rabbeinu literally placed into Shamua ben Zakur the neshama of Reuven ben Yaakov, the original Reuven, the son of Yaakov. We proceed. The Pasuk tells us, tells us Le Mate Shimon means that Moshe Rabbeinu took the neshama of Shimon ben Yaakov and placed it into the leader of Shevet Shimon, who was at that time Shafat ben Chori. Then he took the neshama of Yehuda ben Yaakov, Yehuda, the son of Yaakov, the original Yehuda, and placed it into Kalev ben Yefune, who was at that time the Nasi, the leader of Shevet Yehuda, and so on and so forth. That means that these Meraglim, although they had their own soul inside of them, they were also carrying very precious and holy neshamot. This was the act 
of Ibur Neshama that was done on behalf of these 11 leaders, and we'll talk about that soon. Rashi Bnei Israel Hema. They were literally the leaders of Am Yisrael from past and present. It's an amazing thing. And therefore they had a good chance of succeeded, succeeding in their mission. These men had inside of them a kind of reincarnation of the tribes, of the original tribes. And here's where we run into a problem. You see, one of the tribes was Yosef. Yosef's Shevet was actually split into two represented by his sons, Menashe and Ephraim. Question is, which leader received Yosef's neshama? Was Menashe Zechet to have his father's neshama, or was it Ephraim? Because you can't split the neshama in half. Who received the neshama of Yosef? Now, if you read the psukim accurately, the answer is very clear. The pasuk states, Lemate Yosef, Lemate Menashe. <laughs> oh, that's very interesting. When the Pasuk introduces Yosef, we're being told that Lemate Yosef, the one who inherited Yosef's Neshama, was Lemate Menashe. It was Menashe. So, who received the Ibur Neshama of Menashe, Yosef's representative, who? Gadi Ben Susi. Now that means that whoever represented Shevet Ephraim, the other son of Yosef, did not receive an extra neshama. Who represented the tribe of Ephraim? Read you the Pasuk. Lemate Ephraim Hoshea Mennun. Oh, now that's very significant. So that's when the Ari explains that that's why Moshe Rabbeinu had to bless Yahushua. Yahushua did not carry an additional neshama of any tribe. So although we think that Yahushua was at an advantage because he received Moshe's blessing, in reality, the reason why he was blessed was because he was at a disadvantage. Moshe Rabbeinu felt that since Yahushua did not have that extra neshama, he should also receive a gift. So what did he do? He took the letter Yud, attached it to Hoshea's name, blessed him saying, Ya Yoshiacha me'atzat meraglim. And now Yehoshua was kind of compensated for not having received the same advantage as the other leaders. And notice what happens later on when Hashem apportions the punishment after this mission goes sour. After 10 of the Meraglim incited the people against entering Eretz Yisrael, Yehoshua and Kalev tore their clothing in a dramatic attempt to show the people how what the other spies said was so severe and so dark. And then they tried to calm the people and to encourage them. And they were telling them, the land that we pass through to scout is a very good land. If Hashem desires us, meaning if we do the right thing, He's going to bring us to this land. He's going to give it to us. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Please, they tell them, just don't rebel against Hashem. Don't be afraid of the people who are now in the land, these giants that the, the, the other spies are telling you about. Because if we do as God commands, you know what's going to happen? Their protection, those Gentiles' protection is going to be removed from them and God is going to be with us. We're going to have the salvation. We're going to have the protection. What do you think happened after these two great leaders tried to appease, reassure, encourage, and calm the people? What do you think happened after they tried to make them see a more positive side of things? A more positive side of things. I'll read you the Pasuk because it's hard to believe, but I'll read it to you. Vayom Rukol Ha'eda. The entire Jewish con congregation spoke up and they threatened them. They threatened Kalev and Yahushua. Lirgom Otam Ba'avanim. That if they don't keep quiet, 
They're going to stone them to death. They're going to pelt them with stones. And then what happened? God intervened because he couldn't see this anymore. Couldn't see this anymore. And he spoke with Moshe threatening to annihilate the Jewish people. Only after Moshe's famous plea to spare the lives of Bnei Yisrael, Hashem agreed not to wipe them all out. However, there was one stipulation. Hashem says, no one from the generation of those who left Egypt and continued to test me and continue to rebel against me will be permitted to enter the land, especially after the negative report that the Meraglim came back with. That is, with an exception, with an exception which we'll talk about. And Hashem told him, so tell the people that they're all going to die in the Midbar. Ve'avdi Kalev, but my servant Kalev, Ekev Haita Ruach Acheret Imo. Since he didn't do as the spies did, or spoke in the way that they did, he didn't take the advice of his colleagues, he didn't go along with their intentions, he had a different view. Ve'imale Acharai, and instead he followed me wholeheartedly. I am going to bring him to the land to which he came. And his descendants will drive its inhabitants out and they will inherit. So Kalev is given the schut to enter Eretz Yisrael. And the question the Rabbanim ask is, what happened to Yahushua? Why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu refer to Kalev, but not to Yoshua? He was also encouraging the people. He also didn't come back with a negative report. But I want you to notice the wording in the Pasuk. Let's read it again. Ve'avdi Kalev, but my servant Kalev, Ekev hayta ruach acheret imo. The word ruach is a spirit. Another word for ruach is a spirit. So the Pasuk could also be read this way. Which means, because he was possessed by another spirit, meaning Kalev had another neshama inside of him, he had the ibur neshama of Yehuda ben Yaakov. So the Pasuk is telling us, in comparison to all the other leaders who also had an ibur neshama, the only one who succeeded was Kalev. Therefore, Yehoshua, who didn't have the added neshama, he didn't have a ruach acheret. He represented only himself. So he's not mentioned in this pasuk over here. That means that although the other ten spies had an ibur neshama, that didn't guarantee their success. Ladies, listen very carefully. Why? Because Chachamim tell us they still had bechira chofshit. Are you listening to this? They had free will. The Ibur Neshama, it's supposed to make it easier for you to succeed. But at the end of the day, it's still going to be up to you. It's going to be your Bechira if to listen or to go with the negative side. So it seems that this, this test of the Meraglim was so great that even with the upgrade of Neshamot and even with all the Kedusha that they possessed, they failed. But the Pasuk is telling us that there was one man who had an additional spirit inside of him who did succeed. His name is Kalev ben Yefuneh. He carried with him and he actually obliged to which side? To the Ruach of Yehuda ben Yaakov that was inside of him. Now, do you remember when the Shvatim, when the tribes came down to Egypt to buy food because there was a famine in the land? Remember how they stood in front of the viceroy of Egypt and they didn't know that they were standing in front of their own brother Yosef? Yosef knew that it was them, but they had no idea that it was Yosef. In their wildest dreams, they couldn't imagine that the brother that they sold was now second in command in Egypt and standing before them. But do you remember what Yosef accused them of? What did he say to them? 
He said, מרגלים אתם. Oh, interesting. He accused them of being spies. He knew they weren't spies. Well, he was trying to scare them. Now, we know why he did what he did, but why did he resort to an untruth, to lying? A tzaddik doesn't lie. How could he call them meraglim when he knows they're not meraglim, they're not spies? Says the Yariya Kadosh, Yosef was not lying. Indeed, the Shvatim would one day in the future become those meraglim, those spies. Yosef had Ruach HaKodesh, and through divine inspiration he saw that in the future, Moshe Rabbeinu was going to take the neshamot of his brothers and place them into these meraglim. That's why he called them meraglim, he accused them of that. They thought he was referring to them in the here and now, in the present. That's why they protested, they were, we're not meraglim, we're just shepherds. But Yosef was referring to a future time where they take the position of the spies in the bodies of the leaders of each of the tribes who would represent them. And once we understand this concept of Ibur Neshama, we can move on to another incredible Chidush. The Targum, Yonatan ben Uziel alav shalom, comments on Moshe Rabbeinu changing Yehoshua's name. And he says the following. I'm actually, um, I translated the Aramaic words into English. Listen to what the Targum says. When Moshe Rabbeinu saw the humility of his student Yehoshua, he changed his name, right, from Hoshea to Yehoshua, and blessed him. That's the Targum. We need to understand this, because if Yehoshua was so humble, why would he need a blessing? If he was arrogant, he'd need a huge blessing. But if you see that he's humble, you should say, you know what? You're so special, you're so humble, and because of that, you have nothing to worry about. Humility will protect you. But here it seems that Moshe Rabbeinu says, oh, he's humble? Oh, I gotta bless him. Now, it's not shocking that Yehoshua was humble, that he had anava. After all, he wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu's Talmid, and we know that Moshe was the humblest uh, of men to have ever lived. It's understandable that the student will take on the characteristic traits of the rabbi. After all, Yehoshua lived with uh, Moshe Rabbeinu for many years. He was witness to his superior traits and the extent of Moshe's humility. So it's no big wonder that Moshe's positive uh, midot, his uh, positive characteristic traits, rubbed off on his foremost student Yehoshua. Question is, why does Moshe Rabbeinu feel that Yehoshua requires a bracha, a blessing, because of his outstanding anava? And Chachamim teach us that sometimes anava is not an asset. Sometimes it could be a liability against a person. If humility is not used correctly, it could cause a person to agree with the majority opinion, even though he himself doesn't believe that what they're saying is completely true. But since he doesn't want to oppose them, God forbid, he thinks, oh, if everybody's telling me this, if everybody seems to be having the same opinion, who am I to argue? They're most probably right. They most probably see it the right way. I probably see it the other way because I'm either too involved in it, I'm too in it, I'm in, too, you know, uh, biased. Humility isn't always a positive attribute because when you know and you feel that something is right, right because Hashem is speaking to you and Hashem is saying this is right, this is the right thing to do, this is the right thing to think, even if everybody is saying the opposite, Chachamim say, you have to be assertive and stand on your own principle. You have to have a sense of self and a sense of pride to stand on that principle of what is right and just in the eyes of Hashem. Now Moshe Rabbeinu suspected that the Meraglim would return and the majority opinion will be a negative one, although Yehoshua deep down is pro Eretz Yisrael. So Moshe Rabbeinu was concerned that due to Yehoshua's anava, his humility, he might say, you know what? 
who am I to argue with these 10 rabbis? These 10 Nasi'im, these 10 great leaders of Am Yisrael, if they say Eretz Yisrael is no good, and that being here is not going to be beneficial to us, who am I to argue with them? You know what? I'll agree with them. In such a case, humility is not an asset, it just became a liability. Therefore, Moshe blessed Yehoshua saying, I pray that your humility does not get in the way of you taking a stand for the truth and what would be right and just in the eyes of Hashem. I pray that you're not going to be intimidated by the other ten rabbis, these great men of stature, thinking that if they think what they do, you have to agree with them, even though you feel differently. Now, some of us might wonder, why should Yahushua be intimidated? Ladies, most of us would be intimidated. If you have 10 rabbis, and not just regular rabbis, 10 chief rabbis who come along and they tell you, we think this is no good. We think this is not good for you. It's not going to be good for you, it's not good for your family, it's not good for the whole cloud. What do you think? What's your opinion? Now, maybe deep down you're thinking, well, I, I don't agree that it's not good. I, I agree that maybe it could be good. It could be good if we do X, Y, and Z. But after these ten great rabbis said it's not good, now who am I? I'm nothing compared to these uh, ten hashuvim. You know what? I agree with them. If they say it's not good, it must not be good. I gotta listen to them. Most of us are intimidated by people who are in authoritative positions and in most cases they might be right and we might just have to agree with the majority opinion. That's what the Gemara tells us sometimes, sometimes in most cases we go with the majority. But Chachamim say, not all the time, sometimes there are exceptions and we see it in this case here. Moshe Rabbeinu said, in this case over here, the majority opinion cannot and should not rule because the majority is swayed towards a side that isn't the whole truth and nothing but the truth. In this case here, Am Yisrael's entire future rests on the truth. Therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want the humility to cause Yehoshua to be timid in this particular circumstance. Now, sometimes Hashem appears to us in the way of chesed and at other times in the form of din, of judgment. Hashem is always merciful, but the manner in which we perceive His mercy is different. Our perception changes. Hashem doesn't change. Sometimes we see the mercy of Hashem. Sometimes we feel His kindness and benevolence. We could sense that there's chesed over here. But sometimes Hashem appears in this world through the attribute, through the midah of gvura and din. That's when the judgments come down on a person and he faces very difficult times. That's the reality. There's chesed and there's gvura. Now we always yearn to perceive Hashem through his chesedim. But the gvura is a reality. We can't deny that. So, the name of Hashem, through which everything flows, is the Shem Havaya, spelled Yud, and then a He, and then a Vav, and then a He. This holy name can be configured in 12 different ways. Uh, yud K Vav He is one of the ways. But there are 11 more configurations using those same letters. For example, you could have Yud, and then a Vav, and then a He, and another He. Or you can configure it as a, a He, another He, a Vav, and then a Yud. Or it could be a He, a Vav, and then a He, and then a Yud. But the point is that these four letters have 12 variations and each of the variations are very significant.
And the Ariya Kadosh explains that every month on the Jewish calendar is influenced by one of these configurations, which means that at the beginning of the month, there's a new name of Hashem based on one of these 12 variations that manifest. And the bracha, the blessing of the month, comes down through those letters. That's why we call the Jewish month Chodesh. The numerical value of the first two letters in the word Chodesh, which is a Chet and a Dalet, is equal to 12. 4 and 8 is 12. And Shin, Chodesh, the Shin, is equal to 300. So altogether, it's 312. And since there are 12 variations of Hashem's name, of which the name itself, uh, what we said earlier, the Yud, right, those letters, there's a Yud, there's a He, there's a Vav, and a He, which equals 26. So 12 variations times 26, which is the numerical value of those letters, is 312. Wow. That's why we call a month Chodesh. Because each Chodesh, each month of the 12 months, is influenced by the name Yud, Ahe, Avav, and Ahe, in its designated configuration for that particular month. Now there's a rule. When the name of Hashem is written in its proper order, that represents the ultimate mercy and kindness. Out of the 12 configurations, only one name is in its proper order. The other 11 are out of order, so to speak. And that one name is what I mentioned before, the Shem Havaya, the Yud, a He, and then a Vav, and a He. That's going in the straight order that it's meant to be in. Once we begin to reconfigure outside of the Yud K Vav He, the name is considered out of order. Now, the month that's influenced by the merciful name of Yud K Vav He is Nisan. Nisan is considered the head of all the months of the year. So Nisan has the proper order of God's name. That's why that month is the greatest month, because it's full of mercy. In that month, there were boundless miracles that took place for our people. There was Yetziat Mitzrayim, there was the splitting of the sea, there were Makot in Egypt, which were miraculous as well. All the greatest things happened in the month of Nisan, since the name of Hashem is in its proper configuration. David HaMelech, by the way, Alava Shalom, hinted this in Sefer Tehilim when he wrote the following. Lehagid ki yashar Adonai, to declare that Hashem is upright, tsuri velo avlata bo, my rock in whom there is no injustice. Notice, lehagid ki yashar Adonai, yashar means straight, meaning when Hashem's name is Yashar in its proper order as Yud K Vav He, there's no injustice and there's no trouble. That's Nisan. But every other month of the year contains within it a, a certain amount of judgment because the name of Hashem is not straight, it's not Yashar, it's not in its proper order. And when God's name is not written in order, so then the berachot, the blessings, and all the shefa, all the abundance, flows down from Shamaim in a different way and um, with some judgments. That's what it's like when the name of Hashem is not in its proper order. The abundance and the shefa comes through a different way, and then the shefa and the bracha isn't flowing down in its proper way. So if the name Yud K Vav He represents Hashem's ultimate mercy. What configuration of God's name would represent the ultimate judgment? Obviously, it's the name that's the opposite of Yud K Vav He. The name that's backwards, just as the name of mercy proceeds forward. And that name is spelled a He, then a Vav, and then a He, and then a Yud. That name is the polar opposite. 
which month on the Jewish calendar is under that influence? It's the month of Tammuz. That month is a rough month for Am Yisrael. That month is coming up, by the way. Many terrible things happened in the month of Tammuz. That was the month that the Jewish people worshipped the golden calf. Betrayal is in that month. That's the month that our enemies incited, incited battle against us. That's the month of war and, and friction. Uh, they finished their evil plots in Av. But the trouble begins in Tammuz. The three weeks of mourning is essentially in Tammuz because that's when the judgment begins to kick in in larger dosages. So now we understand the secret of why Tammuz is such a difficult month. It's because the name of Hashem that influences that month is the, in the reversed pattern. Having said that, remember Haman in the story of Purim? Well, first of all, let me tell you the difference between the age-old anti-Semites and the modern-day anti-Semites. The old anti-Semites, they possessed knowledge of Torah. They were actually very well versed in Torah and they used the secrets of Torah against us. They studied, of course, our Torah for the wrong reasons. They studied it in order to hurt us, but they were very familiar with our Torah. Think of Balak, who wanted to destroy the Jews, but he didn't know how to. So he commissioned Bilam HaRasha, the sorcerer, to do the job for him, right? What did Bil'am tell him? He said to him, the God of the Jewish people detests immorality. How did Bil'am know that? He must have known about our laws, maybe he read about how much desp Hashem despises immorality, but the point is that those were the ancient enemies. They knew about our Torah, they knew about our laws, they knew about what Hashem, how Hashem deals with us. Today, the modern day anti-Semites, they don't know anything. They just want to kill Jews. They just want to harm us. They don't know anything not, not about immorality. They don't know anything. They're not interested in a spiritual battle. They just want to take a bomb and drop it on our heads. That's the easy way of doing battle against us. But the ancient anti-Semites wanted to learn our Torah and figure out what angers Hashem. And then they'd use that knowledge to cause us to sin precisely in the area that God despises so that God should punish us. They were smart. So what happened in Megillat Esther? Haman came home and uh, Mordechai was there refusing to bow down to him and Haman became enraged. What does he tell his wife? He says, I'm so angry at this Jew Mordechai. Not only am I going to kill him, I'm going to destroy the entire Jewish nation. And although I'm a wealthy man with many children, even though I have so much power and so much glory, all that I have is worthless in my eyes as long as Mordechai the Jew doesn't bow down to me. Notice the language he used. They were very specific words. He says, V'chol ze einenu shove li. All this is worth nothing to me. What's the last letter in the word ze? It's the letter he. What about the word einenu? What's the last letter in that word? Vav. What's the last letter in the word shove? It's a letter he. And the last letter in the word li is yud. Oh, you see where we're going with this? Interesting. We have over here a he, and then a vav, and then a he, and then a yud. Haman says, v'chol ze einenu shove li. He specifically used these words in order to attract the name of God that in, that's in its reversed pattern. And he did it in order to bring down judgments upon the Jewish people. Haman, you could say it was a kind of mystic, but from the dark side. But what does the Pasuk in Megillat 
state towards the end when the miracle occurred on behalf of the Jewish people and then we were saved and Haman and his ten sons were hung and, and, and his plot was completely uh, uh, eradicated what does the Pasuk state? Nahafochu means to turn upside down, right? To reverse. Haman tried to activate the reversed name, the name of Hashem that's spelled backwards, right? In order to, to bring down a, a severe judgment upon the people. But a Kadosh Bauchu did a He turned it around, and instead we were under the influence of great mercy and we were saved. By the way, this concept happens a lot. Now you may ask, so is there a way we could stay clear of din, of judgment? If judgments are coming down from Shamaim, especially in this upcoming month of Tammuz, we don't want them to affect us. If dinim are coming down, what can we do to protect ourselves? What, should we wear a red string around our uh, wrist? Should we recite the entire Tehillim? Should we give more money for tzedakah? What's this gula for protection against the dinim that come down upon us? Ladies, the great gula to protect yourself from din is anava, is humility that's utilized in the proper and correct manner. The humble person receives protection. And I'll tell you why. Did you ever see a person inside the ocean just as a huge wave comes? What does he do to protect himself from the wave? He lowers himself as far down as he can into the sea so that the wave goes over his head. If he'd remained standing in the water, that wave would knock him down. It's always going to happen that the one who stubbornly remains standing tall and high is going to be the first to get hit. When there's a violent storm and it comes to an end, you know what we end up seeing? You see the biggest trees that somehow toppled over. And you're wondering, how could that happen while the small bushes are still intact? How could it be that the small bushes made it through the storm? Of course the little bushes still remained intact, ladies. Because when the din is coming down to the world, who is it going to hit first? The tallest ones, the ones that are the highest. So the one who has gava is like a right lightning rod. He's attracting din. Arrogance is a very ugly midah. Uh, arrogant people, they inflate the reality of who they really are because they, deep down, they possess very big egos. They don't show it, they actually pretend to be the biggest uh, uh, humble people. But you can see from the way they speak sometimes that they're not so humble. Ga'ava, by the way, is not just a negative trait, it's a very dangerous trait because the judgments are attracted to you. But the humble person who considers himself lowly, the din does not seek him out. It only hits the tallest targets. The low targets are missed. So a great zgula for protection against judgment is proper humility. That's what David HaMelech tells us in Sefer Tehilim. Zivchei Elokim ruach nishbera. The sacrifices of God is a broken spirit. That's the simple interpretation. David is teaching us that the greatest sacrifice you can offer Hashem is the ruach nishbera, a lowly spirit. Hashem says, you keep your animals in your barn, keep all the wine libations, keep all the flower offerings. The greatest korban you could give to me, zivchei elokim, is a lowly spirit. Which means, when you turn to Hashem in your lowest time, with all your broken parts, and you seek him out. Hashem says, you're broken, and you're looking for me? You're, you're shattered. Your ruach is literally nishbera. Your spirit is completely shattered. And you're still with me? Wow, that's the greatest korban you could ever give me. That's the simple interpretation. However, 
Whenever we see the name Elohim, as we do in this Pasuk, we know it represents judgment. So David HaMelech is actually saying, Zivchei Elohim, if you want to annul the judgments, if you want to slaughter, to do a zevach, on the din, if you want to eradicate the judgments, you need to have a ruach nishbera. You have to have a lowly, humble spirit. Nothing can break the midah of din like a lowly spirit. Lev nishbar venitke. A broken heart is not going to be influenced by midat din. Now that's a very important piece of information because Moshe Rabbeinu says, uh oh, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. Why? Because the Meraglim were sent out on the 29th day of the month of Sivan and they returned 40 days later on Tisha Be'av on the 9th of Av. So the majority of this expedition took place during which month? Tammuz! 30 days of this expedition was in Tammuz and Moshe Rabbeinu knew that this is a, a, a dangerous time for everybody, Tammuz, even worse than Av. He knew that the, the configuration for that month of Tammuz is dangerous and how Din is the strongest man. That's why he helped the Meraglim with the Ibur Neshama, the Ad Neshama. That's why he blessed Yahushua. He knew that they're going at the most unfavorable time of the year, which is the month of Tammuz. Now, you might say, well, why did they go in Tammuz? The Chachamim say, sadly, that's when it had to work out for them to scatter out the land strategically. That was the best uh, time. So uh, Moshe felt that th th he needs to give them added strength because they're going in the most inauspicious time of the year. But what happened? The Zohar Kadosh says that since it was Tammuz, the judgments were coming down in a very strong way. And do you know why the ten spies got hit? They failed in their mission and then they were severely punished. Do you know why? The Zohar Kadosh says because they fell into the trap of ga'ava, of arrogance. What do you mean arrogance? Where do we see that? that they were arrogant. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai writes, and I, I utter this very cautiously because we are talking about great men, but the majority of the Chachamim say we can't deny that they sinned in this case. So the Zohar Kadosh gives us a window into the subconscious thoughts and the mind of these Meraglim. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that in the subconscious mind of these ten men, they came back with a terrible report about the land because they made the following calculation. They said, right now, in the desert, we're enjoying our positions of stature as the Nasi'im as the presidents and leaders of our tribe. Right now, we're considered the rabbis of our congregation. But what's going to happen once we enter Eretz Yisrael? It could be that there's going to be re-elections and we're going to be voted out. Because they wanted to maintain their positions as a Nesi'im, that Ga'ava, that arrogance caused them to see the land in an inappropriate fashion. That's why the judgments came down upon them and they were severely punished because they were already, those judgments were already coming down because it was the month of Tammuz and they were coming down in a, in a severe way and of course we know it hit the tallest ones first and who were the tallest ones? They were because of the arrogance. The good news is that the Pasuk informs us that Yehoshua was an Anav. He maintained his humility and that's why he was saved from the terrible sin of the Meraglim. 
He was saved from all those judgments that were coming down. Why? Because he was of lowly spirit. He was the lowest among them. He was a nav, he was humble. However, Moshe Rabbeinu knew that anava is not enough, right? Humility is not enough. There was a problem with Yoshua. What was the problem? His name. His original name was Hoshea, which begins with the letters He, Vav, which is the reverse of the last letters in Hashem's name of mercy, instead of Yud, He, right? And the fact that the letters in his name were reversed, it can cause him to be subject to these strict dinim, the strict judgment. So Moshe Rabbeinu had to think of a way to reverse Hoshea's current name so that the letters appear as they should appear in the straight yashar and proper form. So he took the letter Yud and he placed it in front of the letter He of Hoshea's name. And that turned his name from Hoshea to Yehoshua. But more importantly, now Yehoshua's name began with the first three letters of Hashem's name of mercy, a Yud, and then a He, and a Vav, spelled correctly, right? Which symbolizes Hashem's most merciful name. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu chose the letter Yud and placed it in the beginning of Yehoshua's name. That's what the Targum Yonatan says. When Moshe Rabbeinu saw that Yehoshua was humble, he said, good, good. If he's humble, there's still a way I could do a tikkun for him. I could still rectify in his behalf. If he wouldn't be humble, even if I changed his name a hundred times, you hear this, ladies? Even if I change his name a hundred times, the judgment, the din is still going to find a way to reach him because ga'ava is a magnet for dinim. But now that I realize that he's truly humble, there's a way to help him. I can help him. And then how did Moshe Rabbeinu bless Yehoshua? He said, Ya Yoshiacha. The name of God should save you. Ya, we said, is a yod and a hey. Meaning that name of God should protect you. Why did, uh, why did Moshe employ that name of Hashem? Why didn't he say uh, Shaka Yoshiacha or Elokim Yoshiacha? Why didn't he say Kel Yoshiacha? Why do you use the name of Yud and Ahe? You know why? Because that was Moshe Rabbeinu's way of telling Yehoshua, Yehoshua, the main thing is to remain an Anav, to remain humble. If you remain humble, you're going to succeed. Don't fall into the trap of Ga'ava. Ladies, what's the gematria, the numerical value of the word Ga'ava? Ga'ava is spelled a gimel, aleph, a vav, and a he. That equals 15. The name of Hashem that begins with a yud and a he also equals 15. A yud and a he is 15. So Moshe Rabbeinu Davka said, Ya Yoshiacha me'atzat meraglim. Remember that the plot of the meraglim is going to be surrounded by ga'ava. They have uh, motives, they have an agenda which is rooted in Ga'ava. Therefore you need the neutralizer. You need the name of Hashem that's able to counter Ga'ava, of which both Ga'ava and yod equals 15. They counter each other. Now, what lesson from this entire shiur can we walk away with and apply in our life? When Moshe Rabbeinu told the Meraglim to go to Eretz Yisrael, he said, remember I told you at the beginning of the Shi'ur and how we're going to learn a very valuable lesson at the end which will answer everything that I said at the beginning. This is, this is the lesson that I want you to walk away with amid everything else. When Moshe Rabbeinu told the Meraglim to go to Eretz Yisrael, he said the following words. When you look at the land, mahi, you'll see what it is. What does that mean? 
There's a general rule that whenever you see the word ma spelled with a mem and then a he, that's the word of humility. How so? Well, Moshe Rabbeinu was the humblest of all men, and Chachamim proved it to us, because where do we see his great humility? When he spoke about himself, and he said, V'nachnu ma? Me? What am I? I'm a nothing. I'm significant. I'm a zero. What am I? So Moshe Rabbeinu was offering the Meraglim the secret. He said, U're'itam et ha'aretz. You have to look at the land, but through the eyes of Mahi. If you look at the land with humble eyes, with the eyes of Ma, the judgments of this month are not going to be able to affect you. But if you're going on this journey with arrogance and preset notions and an agenda, if you're going to allow your ego to take over, even if I'm going to give you an ibur neshama of the greatest tzaddikim to help you, it's not going to work. When the Maraglim returned with their terrible reports and each one was giving the most negative version of what they saw, what did Kalev and Yehoshua say? What did they say? Tova ha'aretz me'od me'od. The land is very, very good. Ladies, listen very carefully. The only other time in Jewish literature that we see the words me'od, me'od written, where we see a double me'od, is in the Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, which states, me'od, me'od, heve shfal ruach. You should try to be very, very humble. Oh. The Lublina Rav, Alava Shalom, he does see the connection between this Mishnah and what the Pasuk in our parasha states. You see, Kalev and Yeshua said, Yeshua said, Tova ha'aretz, the land is good. You know when you can see the land as good? Me'od, me'od. When you utilize the midah of me'od, me'od heveshefal ruach. When you look at Eretz Yisrael through humble eyes and with great humility, the land is wonderful. But when there's ga'ava, you're going to come up with the most negative reasons for why we shouldn't journey into the land. When you do that, the judgments in the land become so strong, you won't be given the opportunity to see the land the way it really is. You will not see it as a land flowing with milk and honey. So Moshe Rabbeinu was giving the Meraglim a hint before they even left that they should adapt a humble attitude. And then he blessed Yahushua that his sh humility should be the right kind of humility. He changed his name in order to strengthen that resolve. Sadly, because it was such a strong ga'ava on the part of the Meraglim, the Satan was just as strong and they failed miserably. That's why the word anava, which means humility, equals 131, and that's the same numerical value as the full name of the Satan, which is spelled Samech, Mem, Aleph, Lamed. The Satan's name equals 131 because he's fighting against humility, against Anava. If the Satan can get a person to behave in a conceited manner, he could bring him down. He could cause him to fail. That's what happened to the Meraglim. They failed because of Ga'ava, according to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The power and the positions of leadership got to their heads, and that came in the way of the reality and of the spiritual mission that they were sent on. So you know what lesson we take from this? If you want to succeed and feel the sanctity of Eretz Yisrael, if you want to absorb the wisdom that's in the air, if you want to feel the holiness of the land, if you want to experience its greatness and the Torah that could only be learned the way it's learned over here, you have to leave your attitude back in the United States or wherever you are. But if you come with a negative approach 
and with arrogance, complaining about every little thing that you encounter, complaining about every little thing that could go wrong, if you're packing ga'ava into your suitcase thinking that America is the only place that's going to afford you a comfortable and spiritual life, and I don't even know why, how you could say that today, you're not going to feel or see the goodness of the land. You're also, chas v'shalom, might be stunted from being given the schut to be here one day. So, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Meraglim, ureitem et ha'aretz mahi. You must see this land through the midah of ma, the midah of anava, of humility. You have to humble yourself before the land, and that's when you're going to feel the bracha of the land. You have to remember that Eretz Yisrael is the house of God, and the only house of God. You are in the palace of Hashem when you're here. Tova ha'aretz, me'od, me'od. In the palace of Hashem, there's great beauty to be seen and to be felt, but only when you have the midah of me'od, me'od, hevei shafal ruach. Only when you humble yourself in the presence of the holiness that exists here. Uh, I once heard a man tell Rabbi Mansour, at one of the shiurim in Brooklyn, I think it was a Thursday night shir, he, and the Rav was talking about the beauty of Eretz Yisrael and, and possibly moving to Eretz Yisrael. And, and he said to him, Rabbi, I don't know why, uh, I don't feel the Kedusha that you're talking about in Eretz Yisrael. I don't get the same feeling you do. And the Rabbi answered him very sharply. He said, that's because you're still thinking about yourself. You're thinking about uh, your nice house, probably, and all the materiali materialism you're holding on to. You're thinking of yourself, the things you want to accomplish, that you think you won't be able to accomplish in Eretz Yisrael, all the people you leave behind. It's about you. It's about you. If you relinquish your own fears and desires, and you'll adapt humility as you trade, he told the guy, then you'll experience uh, Eretz Yisrael in a, in a glowing light. If you're going to approach the Holy Land with a selfless attitude, you're going to feel the Kiddushah of the land and what it has to offer you. It's so true. And of course, we know when there's Ga'ava, there's something that suddenly blocks you, and it not just blocks you, it turns, it turns into something very dangerous. That's something practical we could learn. The lesson of the Meraglim is that if we'd uh, if, if they would have relinquished their ga'ava at the entrance to Eretz Yisrael, they maybe would have returned with a glowing report, and as a result, everything would have been different. Unfortunately, the Satan defeated them, and their failure caused tremendous repercussions. But you know what? We can rectify on behalf of our ancestors. We can make our way to Eretz Yisrael without delay, without stories, without justifications. We're already witnessing so many families returning to this land from all over the world. And it's very clear from the direction in which the world is heading in that we should make efforts to move towards the Aliyah process because when danger will arise, Eretz Yisrael will be the only safe haven for Jews. Ladies, Yiratzon, that we should remember the lesson of the Miraglim, adapt it, and work on developing the Midah of Anava, so that when Hashem gives us the Zechut to finally be here, we'll see Eretz Yisrael through the eyes of humility and through the eyes of truth. I pray and I hope to see you all joining, joining me here Bekarov very soon. Amen Ken, Yehi Ratzon. Thank you.